A lot of times, kids end up committing crimes without really thinking about the consequences. And that attitude can go all the way up to their day in court, when finally the seriousness of whatever they've done hits them. But even then, it can take until the sentence is read out before they realize that they're in big trouble. And at that moment, things can get pretty wild and emotional. From the kid who killed his half-brother, to the kid who shot three of his classmates, here's 20 teenage convicts reacting to life sentences. <laughs> <sighs> Number 20. Jacob Morgan This is how teens reacted after hearing their sentence. We start off with a pretty tragic case. A 17-year-old autistic child who set fire to his house and his infant half-brother cried openly in court as he received a 15-year sentence. Jacob Matthew Morgan sobbed as he entered a guilty plea for lighting the fire that Joshua Hill, a 14-month-old baby back in March of 2015. After the teenager's arrest, his family in Rock Hill, South Carolina supported him and his mother, Julie Hill Dover, argued his innocence in court. Joshua, 17, was sleeping when the fire began, according to Mrs. Hill Dover and her husband, Mike Hill, Morgan's stepfather and Joshua's father, who had left Morgan to care for Joshua. However, according to Morgan's parents, his neighbors warned him to stay away from the blazing home and then restrained him as he attempted to run inside to rescue his brother. They contend that Morgan, who has developmental problems as well and has difficulty with reading and writing, confessed to lighting the fire under pressure during a five-hour questioning that was not recorded by the cops. Morgan reportedly provided investigators with a variety of explanations for how the fire began, and overall it seems like he was just confused by the whole event. The prosecution also alleged that Morgan admitted to setting a fire in the home two weeks before, and that he told authorities he was intrigued by fire in general. Morgan sobbed uncontrollably and fell to the ground during the prosecution's description of the trailer park fire that claimed Joshua's life during a preliminary hearing last year. The adolescent would suffer a lot in prison due to his sensitive nature and mental health issues, according to his attorney, who's also noted that the case was among the most difficult he's ever handled. Well, this seems like one case where the outcome surely could have been a different sentence than 15 years in jail. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. TJ Lane Sentencing For the shooting d**ks of three Chardon High School classmates, Daniel Parmador, Russell King, and Demetrius Hewlin, this guy was given life sentence without the possibility of parole. The punishment given to T.J. Lane provided some consolation to the survivors after such a traumatic experience. Life without parole in Ohio used to mean just that, life without parole. But three years later, Ohio state legislator considered two bills that would show mercy to Lane. A who showed no mercy on February 27th of 2012. A juvenile who's been given a life sentence without parole would be able to apply for parole after 35 years under the House bill. The Senate's proposal is more lenient, allowing for consideration of parole after the offender turns 40. However, Lane lost his appeals even after the 2012 ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court that outlawed mandatory life sentences without the possibility of parole. These punishments are not legally required in Ohio. Instead, a life without parole sentence may only be imposed after the trial judge has reached certain conclusions, which may include taking the offender's age into account. The new law would prevent judges from actually giving a juvenile a no parole sentence. The length of an inmate's sentence would instead be decided by a parole board. But either way, TJ Lane looks like he'll be in for a long stretch as a cold-blooded no matter his age. Number 18. Sendil Jackson Sentencing Now we move on to another sentence of life behind bars without the possibility of parole. This time, it's the man convicted of 
University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee film student Nathan Potter. As the sentence was read out, Sindel Jackson was dragged to the ground, pepper sprayed, and brought away under security from the courthouse. He wasn't too happy about the idea of spending the rest of his life in prison. As three deputies and Milwaukee Police Detective James Hutchinson took Jackson to the floor of Milwaukee County Circuit Judge Rebecca Dallet's courtroom, Jackson spewed a series of expletives at her. Jackson's counsel, Patrick Early, had requested Dale to consider Jackson's age, 19, and as Early characterized it, his lack of impulse control, while determining the appropriate sentencing. He certainly showed off his lack of control. Jackson's family members heckled Potter's family from the rear of the courtroom as police fought to contain Jackson. A lady shouted at the Potters, I hate you, I hate you all. Another lady shouted, God's the judge, at Potter's parents who were hugging and sobbing. God's the judge! A jury found Jackson, 19, guilty in first degree intentional m and attempted robbery in connection with the shooting and m Potter, who was 21 years old. Mark Williams, an assistant district attorney, played recordings of Jackson's response to the jury. Jackson turns to face Potter's family in the recording, mouths an expletive, and smirks. A few minutes after the judgment was read out, Jackson is seen being escorted from the courthouse in the footage. He turns and chuckles as he passes the Potter family, and he approaches the courthouse entrance. I wonder if he'll feel the same way at the end of his sentence, in as long as 60 or 70 years. Number 17. Jaleel Smith Riley Sentencing in the next case, Jaleel Smith Riley attempted to have his guilty plea dismissed, but the judge rejected his request and gave him a life sentence without the possibility of parole. This was for the m of a woman and severe injury to her boyfriend. As soon as Smith Riley heard his punishment, he passed out cold. In 2013, Portia Brooks and her boyfriend Aaron Martin were both shot by Smith Riley during an attempted robbery. Brooks died, but Martin did not. Martin's brain injury from the has left him with ongoing health problems. Two years later, Smith Riley was apprehended as a result of a report to Crime Stoppers. In August of 2016, Smith Riley admitted to aggravated <laughs> The contents of a letter he later addressed to the court about retracting his guilty plea are unknown. Smith Riley could have faced the death penalty. Smith Riley sought to amend his guilty plea, but the court rejected that request at a hearing. The hearing for his sentence was then opened by Judge Charles Kubicki. Smith Riley sobbed and expressed regret. Before the court announced the punishment, Brooks's mother and Martin's sister both talked about the shootings and how it impacted their lives. Number 16. Brandon Spencer breaks down in tears after getting 40 years to life. Brandon Spencer, a former gang member who was sentenced to 40 years to life in prison for attempted the age of 21, sobbed like a baby upon hearing that he'll spend the remainder of his life in prison. When Spencer arrived at a Halloween party at USC in 2012, with the intention of getting even with a gang rival, three innocent bystanders, as well as his intended target, were shot and wounded. Some contended that Spencer's actions were those of a young, impulsive mind that could be healed and developed through rehabilitation and education. In contrast to Judge Banks' observation that they were, quote, object lesson by wannabe gangsters carrying some claim that Spencer's race may have affected his sentence by citing much shorter prison terms given to number 15 Dexter Johnson sentencing a judge took the unusual step of rejecting a state request for a new execution date for a convicted just after Dexter Darnell Johnson won an unanticipated last-minute stay of execution. The execution of the brain-damaged Houston man who was linked to five committed during a month-long crime spree in 2006 was originally set for May 2nd of 2019. However, he narrowly escaped death when a federal judge decided that a newly appointed legal team needed more time. But then the case turned into a contentious legal dispute between two barristers about who had the right to take part in the hearing. After the federal legal team spent weeks criticizing the local defense attorney Patrick McCann of poor quality legal work and attempting to have him removed from the case, local prosecutors tried to exclude federal public defenders from the state court hearings. 
Judge Greg Glass listened to nearly an hour of arguments before deciding to postpone the decision until after a federal court hearing the following month, rather than approving the state's request for an execution date. A lot more bureaucracy involved in Texas than I guess I imagined. There's no question that Mr. Johnson is a bad guy, Judge Glass said. Despite the tension, it was a stark contrast to the previous time the trial court set a date for execution in this case. At that hearing, Johnson's family were crying and praying there, while his victim's relatives yelled angrily at the chained prisoner, who said he understood their animosity but still denied his guilt. Number 14. Erica Butts and her co-defendant Shanita Cunningham. Next up, we have this clip which shows two lesbian lovers who cried violently, hyperventilated, and collapsed to the floor in a Charleston courtroom as they learned that they would spend the rest of their lives in jail for the three-year-old child. In order to be wheeled out of the room, these two had to be scooped up off the floor and put in wheelchairs. After she cried at her daughter to get up and screamed, I can't leave my baby like this, my baby is out. The three staff employees violently threw Butt's mother outside. A clerk can be heard asking if there are any EMTs in the building as the gallery filled with the sound of weeping. As Butt's hyperventilated, other people urged her to breathe more slowly. Toddler Serenity Richardson was 2009 while under the care of Butts and Cunningham, two 25-year-olds from Somerville, South Carolina, who were warned that they would spend the rest of their life behind bars. The young child, Serenity, had urinated on the floor, so Butt struck her with her belt, she said to Somerville police. Serenity was already dead when the emergency personnel arrived. She had been filled with bleach and put on ice in a desperate attempt to revive her, so they said. Undoubtedly, this awful torture warranted a severe penalty. Number 13. Teen caught smiling during sentencing in murder of Ann Arbor student. This spectacle in a courtroom in Washtenaw County was stunning. As Jordan Clee's family members read impact statements in front of the court, the teen who admitted to killing the 18-year-old Ann Arbor resident grinned and almost laughed. Quote, My kid, my baby, my buddy, and my only child are all gone. I also lost my ability to laugh and love. I'm no longer hopeful to have grandkids. So said the victim's mother, who was too distraught to read herself. So she had a family member give the statement in court. Donta Wright, the defendant, who is 17 years old, addressed the court thereafter and stated, Just wanted to let you know I'll be back home soon. I cherish my family. The judge was not pleased with Wright's statement and inquired of the prosecution as to whether the sentence was too light. I'm tempted to just say, I'm not going to accept this sentencing agreement and we'll go to trial. Warning you that if you're found guilty of felony m you'll spend the rest of your life behind bars. As I watch you sit there, smile, laugh, and shake your head like this was no big deal, Judge David Schwartz said. I'm inclined to do just that. The family allegedly requested during a short break that the matter not go to trial because they wanted to move on. After the break, Wright's attorney apologized on the teen's behalf, claiming that he has mental problems and that some individuals display fear by smiling. For killing Klee, Wright received a sentence of 23 to 50 years in jail. Number 12. Nicholas Lindsay sentencing. Should the punishment be lowered for a police murder who was under 16 at the time, currently serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole for the 2011 murder of St. Petersburg police officer David Crawford, we have Nicholas Lindsay. After starting his long stretch, Lindsay returned to a Pinellas courtroom to request a sentence reduction due to new laws. Due to a recent change in the law, juveniles cannot now be given life sentences without the possibility of parole, as Lindsay was in 2012. His attorneys are asking the court to reduce Lindsay's sentence to 40 years. The defense's claim that the law requires a lesser sentence was rejected by Judge Thane Covert. With a name like that, the guy sounds like a protagonist in a spy thriller. And According to prosecutors, the crime was committed by a seasoned criminal with a history of arrests, rather than a youthful error. A number of residents in the area where Lindsay grew up and Officer Crawford also hoped the sentence would be reduced, however, saying he wasn't such a bad guy, really. However, Officer Crawford's daughter Amanda sobbed as she told the court that she and her father would never be given a second chance. And so neither should the killer. Number 11. Martis Fuller Sentencing in May of 2019, a teenager was found guilty of shooting and 
his ex-girlfriend and attempting to her mother. He'll serve the remainder of his life behind bars without the chance of parole. On May 19th of that year, Judge Mary K. Wagner of Kenosha County sentenced Martins Fuller, who was then 18 years old. Earlier in March, a jury had found Fuller responsible for the shooting death of Kaylee Juga, 15, and the attempted sh of Stephanie Juga, her mother. For the Wagner sentenced Fuller to life in prison without the possibility of supervised relief. The sentences for the attempted and the burglary are to be served concurrently following the life term. According to the prosecution, Fuller blamed Kaylee and her mother for his removal from the football team and expulsion from school. They claimed that Fuller, who was 15 years old at the time, planned to obtain a and ammunition from a friend and had a family member destroy a that matched the one used in the shooting. After being shot five times, Kaylee passed away immediately. Stephanie Juga recognized Fuller as the person she confronted that terrible day in her home and was later shot while attempting to flee. Later, Juga discovered daughter Kaylee on the floor of her bedroom, lifeless. Carl Johnson, the defense attorney for Fuller, urged the judge to allow Fuller the chance to be released in 25 to 30 years during the hearing. When Fuller had the chance to address the court, the defense co-counsel Julian Schadiger instead read a letter he wrote in which he blamed a media circus for his problems problems and insisted that he was innocent. Number 10. Tia Skinner and Company Mara McCalman found it very difficult to face her attempted in court, but not out of fear or anger. It was because she had reared her youngest kid with such affection, and it was that kid who she now had to face in court as the one who tried to and not only that, Mara McCalman had to face seeing her daughter Tia get life sentences in the St. Clair County Courthouse three times over. Nearly four years after the assault that left Mara with more than 25 stab wounds and her husband Paul Skinner the last of the three sentencings took place in September of 2014. Most victims have to go through one sentencing hearing, during which they may explain to the court how the guilty party affected their life, what they lost, and what they're struggling with now, and then learn how the defendant will be punished. Just a year had passed since the assault inside the Skinner's Yale home when Tia Skinner, Jonathan Kurtz, and James Preston were all given life sentences without the possibility of release. McCalman and her family returned to Kelly's courtroom after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 2012 that mandatory life in prison without the possibility of release for young offenders is cruel and unusual punishment. So the trial had to take place again, and finally a third time, before Tia was locked up once and for all. Number 9. Ronnie O'Neill Sentencing Family members of a mother and daughter who were brutally in 2018 were present in the courtroom as a judge handed down three consecutive life sentences. Ronnie O'Neill, who was found guilty of his girlfriend and his nine-year-old daughter and trying to his eight-year-old son at their home, received a sentence of life in prison without the chance of parole. Throughout the trial, his surviving young son testified against him. The victim's family gave an emotional testimonial to Judge Michelle Sisko before she read out the sentence. O'Neill, according to Kenyatta Barron's mother, Carrie Lloyd, stole angels from the family, including his daughter Ron Nivia, who was nonverbal and had special needs. Lloyd expressed her dissatisfaction with the jury's decision and her desire for O'Neill to get the death sentence. She said that O'Neill insulted the jury, having represented himself in the double m case, and blamed Barron for the c**ts, making a mockery of the legal system. For the majority of her testimony, Lloyd sobbed uncontrollably. O'Neill then rose to spoke while still being restrained and wearing a red prison uniform. He declared that he would not offer an apology for his crimes as he turned to face the jury and the distraught Lloyd. Number 8. Antonio Barbu Sentencing a 14-year-old kid who used a hatchet to his 78-year-old great-grandma in 2013 sobbed in court as he was handed his punishment. For the crime, Antonio Barbu had recently received a sentence of at least 36 years in jail. He will be liberated after he hits 50, but his whole youth will be behind him by then. Barbu attempted to read an apology but broke down in tears. He delivered the statement to his defense attorney, who struggled to read it while also holding back tears. Barbu and Nathan Pape used a hatchet to 
Barbara Olson in her Sheboygan, Wisconsin home. When she turned around to call out to Barbu's mother after inviting them into her home, Barbu struck her in the head with a hatchet. He said that after leaving the room because he felt unwell, he returned to find Pape having repeatedly beaten the elderly woman with a hammer. The court found that Barbu's 2009 automobile accident-related brain damage left him with an unspecified cognitive disorder, which contributed to his choice to commit a crime. Even if he had a brain damage, is nevertheless violent, and he'll now be in prison for a very long time. Number 7. Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero have been sentenced to life in prison with a chance of parole after 22 years for killing Halseth's father in April of 2021. A young girl and her boyfriend were found guilty of fatally st the girl's father and were given a life sentence with the chance of parole. Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero acknowledged in May of 2022 that they had 45-year-old Daniel Halseth attempted to set fire to his home and then stolen his vehicle and bank card before fleeing to Salt Lake City. On April 9, 2021, Halseth's charred corpse, which had been chopped and stabbed 70 times, was discovered in the garage of his house in northwest Las Vegas. Four days later, the youths were apprehended in Salt Lake City. Sierra and Guerrero were given life sentences with the prospect of parole after 22 years by District Judge Tierra Jones. Additionally, $5,000 in reparations was demanded from the offenders. Sierra was 16 years old when the occurred. Guerrero was 18 years old. The two defendants entered guilty pleas to all charges they were up against, including four counts of fraudulent use of a credit or debit card, as well as with a deadly weapon, conspiracy to commit arson, robbery with a deadly weapon, and conspiracy to conduct robbery. Sierra spoke to the court while reading from a statement at the sentencing hearing. Sierra said in the statement that her father had physically and sexually assaulted her, and had coerced her into drinking alcohol, which contributed to her actions. But she still faces more than two decades behind bars for her actions. Number 6. Damon Kemp Convicted for Double Homicide Damon Kemp, 19, was yelling as he entered court that morning. Kemp was charged with two counts of second-degree murder in connection with the discovery of two 19-year-old victims who had been shot. Around 8 o'clock in the evening, Trey Ingram and Jordan Payton were discovered shot to death in an apartment. At the first appearance hearing, relatives of the victims were present. Kemp's bail was rejected by the court, who found probable cause for these charges. Upon learning about an armed burglary, deputies first began looking around the neighborhood. Ingram was a student at the Bethune-Cookman University who had been taking a semester off, according to family members. Kemp and the victims were friends, but that didn't much help his case after his very unfriendly actions. Number 5. A teen has been sentenced to prison for a plot to kill her family. A 17-year-old Detroit resident who had planned to murder her family received a 10-20 to 20 year prison term in 2016. Roxana Sikorsky admitted to one count of attempted after she admitted to slitting the throat of her younger brother in October of 2014 at their Plymouth Township home. Prosecutors allege that she intended to all four members of her adopted family, even though the child survived the attack and no one else was hurt. In a statement that she made in court, her mother claimed that at the time she was influenced by her older boyfriend. In the case, the boyfriend was also accused. Sikorsky expressed regret prior to being sentenced. She said, I would like to apologize to my family for not being the daughter they would have liked me to be. And in other news, one of the biggest understatements I have heard in the new year so far. Number 4. Jaleel Hoskins is sentenced. In 2014, a self-confessed lost his cool in court after being sentenced to 50 to 100 years in jail for his girlfriend, a mother of five, and throwing her corpse in a dumpster. Jaleel Hoskins of Grand Rapids, Michigan apologized profusely to the family of Latrice Mays, who he in March before being informed of his destiny. He said he loved the woman and hadn't intended to take her life. He had shown restraint in the courtroom, but he lost control as Kent County Circuit Court Judge James Redford gave the defendant a sentence of up to 100 years in prison. 
Hoskins threw the podium at the bench and lunged forward before security hauled him from the courtroom. Hoskins' family, including the victim's mother and father, started yelling at the victim's family before he had even left the premises. Additional court officials had to pry the two families apart as they raced at one another and shouted at one another. Redford pounded his gavel and commanded order as Hoskins' distraught mother, who had previously delivered an impassioned speech to the court, called at Hoskins' cousin to stop talking. On the third day of the trial, the 26-year-old abruptly ended it by entering a plea of guilty to second-degree in the middle of the testimony. But his sudden dramatic guilty plea didn't convince the judge to let him off lightly for brutally strangling a woman, then her body. Number 3. Dylan Shoemaker Sentence Sometimes, those who turn on the tears are saved from the worst punishments. It is for that reason that Dylan Shoemaker, a 17-year-old from Buffalo, New York, believed he would get away with his girlfriend's 23-month-old son. Shoemaker was found guilty of second-degree and appeared in court for sentencing. When State Supreme Court Justice M. William Baller was prepared to impose punishment, Shoemaker was prepared with his sad face and tears, but one unexpected obstacle stood in his way. His own words. <laughs> In a now viral video, Bowler read to Shoemaker, I'm a 16-year-old blonde. Shoemaker said in a recording, which he had not known the court had uncovered, probably all I'll have to do is cry and they're gonna feel sorry for me. Although it is amusing to see Schumacher forced to retract his statements, and more significantly, the subsequent 25 to life sentence, the case itself is not so amusing, as a young child was horrifically the truth was revealed, and Shoemaker will thankfully serve the appropriate sentence for the crime. Number 2. Morgan Gaser apologizes before sentencing in Slender Man case. We've told you that Slender Man was bad. How many times did we warn you? Well, things just got serious in the Slender Man case. Two Wisconsin women who were committed to a state mental hospital following a sixth grade classmate's 2014, claimed the crime was committed to appease the Slender Man. Following the sentencing, Morgan Geyser, 20 of Waukesha County, requested Waukesha County Judge Michael Boren order her release just as he did for her co-defendant, Anissa Weyer, who spent nearly four years in an Oshkosh mental health facility. Boren selected three medical professionals to assess Geyser's mental health. Prosecutors claim that in May of 2014, after luring Peyton Lutner from a sleepover to some woods in a Waukesha park, Geyser repeatedly s***ed Lautner while Wire encouraged her to continue. They were all 12 years old at the time. Lutner was left for d by Geyser and Weyer, but she managed to escape the woods and was found by a passing cyclist. She was stabbed 19 times and according to the medical personnel who treated her, barely lived. Later that day, while crossing Interstate 94 in Waukesha, police discovered Weyer and Geyser on foot. In order to become Slender Man's servants and stop him from their families, they claimed to be on their way to his mansion in northern Wisconsin when they attacked Lutner. Number 1. Marcel Brooks Sentencing A Buffalo man who admitted to seriously injuring a toddler was sentenced to be in prison for 15 years. A 22-month-old boy was shaken by Marcel Brooks, 25, at his Toananda home. The child, who recovered from his injuries, was being babysat by Brooks, according to the police. Brooks attempted to change his guilty plea to a not guilty plea before he was given a punishment. Video evidence in the court today. The judge turned down his appeal. In court, Brooks declared his intent to appeal, but he also chose to insult everyone in the courtroom. So, that appeal will likely begin with an apology for that, I guess. Do you think these kids deserved their sentences? How can we stop there being so many teen criminals? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time!